to start with, for those of you that have never heard of or met me before, I'll just give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, back at school, I was not what you might have called a model student. Um, in fact, uh, I left school early with nothing of, of note to my name. I had a few dead end jobs as I tried to navigate the world until eventually I stumbled into a state agency in the poorest part of East London and I loved it. In fact, I think uh, my area manager from back then might even be on the call today. I worked various roles in a state agency and mortgage advice in the 90s, eventually becoming a property investor myself. Throughout this time, I also had a very keen interest in computers and the way in which the internet had started transforming the world. Eventually, in the late 90s, I moved more into the technology side of things in the city. And in 2001, I started my very first business. It feels like it's been a very long journey from there, but I've now got 20 years experience building up various different companies. And it's been an amazing journey of discovery for me. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with and alongside some of the most famous business people in the world that I'm proud to call both friends and mentors. I've stood on stage and spoken in front of thousands of people. I've had my own TV show on Sky to help businesses work smarter, and I've written two best-selling business books, one of which became the number two business book in the world. Why am I telling you this? Um, I'm telling you this as I hope that over the next couple of hours, I can break down 30 years worth of my uncomfortable findings and experiences to make you really feel like you've learned something important from today that will genuinely help your business as opposed to just hearing about some new features in a software that you don't particularly give a shit about. Uh, oh yes, uh, I'm supposed to also have warned you that apparently I have a tendency to swear, but to be honest, I've, I've never really noticed it. So let's kick off this webinar about the new age of a state agency. <clears throat> Before we jump straight into it, there, are, there seems to be far too many solutions out there to problems that don't really seem to exist. So what is actually causing a problem for our industry currently, and why does it need to move into a new age at all? Well, the things that I'm going to identify in this particular webinar are related to annoying marketing, the way that agents do their marketing to the public and why the public still continue to see them as uh, a kind of second rate service. Uh, the problem of admin in a, straight, in a state agency, it's very admin intensive. And the service issue in a state agency, which is being caused by a lack of innovation. But worse still, this all leads to us being an endangered species. And in this webinar, I'll try to show you why. So, Let's break this down into those three problems of marketing, admin, and service. The marketing side of things. So first up, for this, I'd like to share some information that I wrote about in my first book. And to do so, we need to go back to how marketing worked before the internet. Some of you will remember this time clearly, others of you not so much. But either way, I need you to cast your mind back to a world with no internet, no smartphones, no email, no social media. A business task with their marketing was to try and find all of the people in the active market looking at their product or service amongst the sea of people out there that were not looking for their product or service. So they were trying to find the active market, the few people hidden amongst the many. The way that companies would do this was through something called interruption based marketing, with the idea being you get your message in front of people by interrupting things they do regularly. So as an example, if you could afford it, then you could take a TV advertisement in the middle of one of the most popular shows in the country. That way you're going to reach the eyeballs of as many people as possible, interrupting something they like doing, but getting your message in front of them while, while, while they do it. If you can't afford TV advertising, next down might be radio and down and down the list we go right down to things like leaflets and cold calling. As annoying as that sounds now, it was actually quite useful back then because I didn't have any way of doing my own research. As I said, there was no internet. All we had was the yellow pages. So you weren't going to sit and have a browse through that. 
So if, I, if my washing machine is rattling and then I see an advert on the telly for this new award-winning washing machine, it's, it's quite useful to me. Now, less so because I just go on the internet and I Google washing machines and I make my own decision. But one of the many problems of this type of marketing is the wastage. Uh, there's a huge amount of waste. For instance, if, if you drop 20,000 leaflets and get three good responses, you might be quite happy but you're not really considering that 19,997 of the people you contacted totally ignored you or worse still found it annoying. Interruption-based marketing has no real long lasting effect. It doesn't, if I drop a leaflet to somebody, they don't really remember it or pay any attention to it in six months, 12 months, 18 months time, meaning that you have to do it over and over and over again forever it just becomes a massive expense. It doesn't get any easier over time. Then if we fast forward 20 years, along, along has come the internet, social media, smartphones, search engines, e-commerce, and the world flips completely on its head. The power of interruption-based marketing drops off a cliff as people now carry the entire world's information around with them on a mini computer in their pocket. So I don't really need companies to fill up my post box with shit I can find quite easily myself. It's just annoying to me. Even waiting five seconds to click, uh, to click skip on a YouTube uh, video is frustrating. Your finger hovers over that skip button just waiting for it to appear. So how does marketing work in today's world? Well, fortunately, Google did a big piece of research called the Zero Moment of Truth in about 2015. And they tried to find out exactly this. How does marketing work in today's world? And specifically, how is a company like Apple making people walk into somewhere like the Carphone Warehouse where they're surrounded by all of these products, prices, options, stuff for free, and just make people ignore it all and walk up to the counter and ask for the new iPhone, even though it's super expensive, which is is pretty relevant for estate agents, certainly in terms of uh, fees. <clears throat> so what Google did was they teamed up with some universities uh, when, they, when they did this study. And they also looked at 15 years worth of browsing data um, on the kind of journey that people go on before they buy products or services. And they found some really interesting stuff. First of all, when they were looking at the neuroscience in the brain, what they found is that there's, there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus, and it works like a bouncer at a nightclub. So basically, uh, it blocks out all of the ad messages that you get interrupted with every day. You don't even notice that there's a logo on the computer in front of you anymore. You don't notice uh, the logos when you open the fridge or vans that drive past you with their signage on. You don't, you don't really notice any of that stuff. The hippocampus blocks it all out. Otherwise, you'd have information overload blocks out all the faces you see when you're walking down the street, even stops you from remembering people's names once they've introduced themselves to you. However, um, what they also found is that <clears throat> on the other side of the hippocampus, the brain holds uh, information that, about things that it no likes and trusts. Uh, so members of your family, um, even brands that you like sit over that side of the brain. So in the study, they tried to find out how do you get past this hippocampus and what they found was that it boils down to something called 7114. You have to spend seven hours with somebody, have 11 touch points and meet them in four different locations. And if you can do that, the hippocampus opens and you move over into the known like trusted side of the brain. It's not even a conscious decision. So uh, if you are walking down a busy market and people are trying to get you to come into their shops and all of this sort of stuff, and you, you're just ignoring everybody. And then in the distance, you see a friend from school you notice that person like there's a spotlight shining on them and you, you see them through the crowd. It works the same way with celebrities. Uh, very kind of current at the moment, Tiger Woods has just had his accident. Loads of people are super concerned for him. And, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be. I'm just saying that they're concerned in the same way that they would be if they knew the person. But for most people, I'm guessing you're not close friends with Tiger Woods. <clears throat> so how is this relevant for products and services? Well, it's relevant because what Google then looked at was people's browsing data. And what they started to notice was actually the journey that people go on before they buy products or services is very, very similar. 
uh, they seem to go onto Google and ask questions. And very quickly, they narrow their product search down to maybe three, three or four products. Very quickly after that, they narrow it down to just one or two. And shortly after that, just one. But they don't buy that product. They continue to do research on it. Not incessantly, they don't sit there researching it like crazy, but they visit things about that site. Every now and then it pops back into their head and they do a little bit more research or they see something on social media or they see something in their email or they watch a YouTube video. And they continue to do this until basically they 7-Eleven for themselves. They spend seven hours with the content, have 11 touch points and see it in four different places. And then they feel like they, they, they know, like and trust that brand and they buy the product. <clears throat> so when people walk into the car phone warehouse, they're not going there to shop. They're going there to buy. They've already done their research. That's why they're not interested in what the sales guy's got to say. They're not even interested when there's a big sign up saying free phone that you never have to pay for every month. It still wouldn't make them buy it. They've already 7-Eleven for themselves on something else. Interestingly, they also found that businesses not working this way are having the reverse effect and actually encouraging people to know, like and trust those companies that are 7-Eleven for in them. Some crazy statistics come out of it. 90% of potential clients won't take a cold call. You think about all those people you phone every day that don't answer their phone and then stop and think about that for a minute. Like back in the days when I was an estate agent, yeah, we would phone people. They wouldn't answer their phone. They were out. It'd go to their answer phone. No one's out anymore. The phone goes everywhere with them. It goes to bed with them. Like they just don't want a fucking answer. They're not out. So these people don't want a cold call. And by, by phoning them, actually, the, 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 the research showed you're driving them towards other companies that are 7-Eleven foreign people. And all of these uh, interesting stats came out of it. So going back to the 20,000 leaflets we mentioned with the three inquiries, actually, you encourage 19,997 people to look elsewhere. It's crazy. But how do you 7-Eleven for people if you can't just bury them in letters and leaflets? <clears throat> well... Companies took this research and started to think, huh, this is very clever. Actually, we need to stop looking at the market like active and dormant people and start looking at the whole market as just one big funnel with everyone at different stages and then try to think, what would be helpful to people at those different stages in order to 7-Eleven for everyone and automatically feed people towards us so that when they do reach the active market, we've already 7-Eleven for them. This is the reason that people walk into the car phone warehouse, as I mentioned before, and just buy the iPhone. They've been 7-Eleven Ford over a long period of time. So now knowing this, when you look at all the mega companies that have arrived in the last 10 to 20 years, they are all built around the principles of the zero moment of truth and 7-Eleven four. They're not working the active market only. They want as much data as they can possibly get their hands on. Their systems are then automatically putting the right things in front of the right people, depending on where they are on their journey to becoming a client, and they 7-Eleven for everybody. Importantly, their systems then also tell their salespeople who to call to make them super efficient at making the right calls and sending the right emails to the right people at the right moment, as opposed to just blasting everybody and hoping for the best with a team that are probably your most high value staff, just doing random stuff. <clears throat> so this is where content marketing comes from. Some of you do this form of marketing. Some of you try, but can't really see the benefit of it. Some of you don't do it at all. But here's the thing. This is now the only kind of marketing. It's not that you can't say anything sousy about your company. Of course you can. But you create content for people at all stages. As an example, people who live in your area that own a property and have no intention of selling. Well, as an estate agent, you're an expert in property and the local area. So you can talk about any of those two things. So those people might find content about the local area or local businesses interesting. 
7 Eleven Four taught us you don't have to talk about yourself. They just have to spend seven hours with you, have 11 touch points, and see you in four different locations. So you, you can talk about some random stuff if you want. If they like it and they do those three things, you're going to win. So you can create content like that. What you don't want to do is go off making random content about random subjects, uh, how to bake banana bread. Like, no offense. But I don't want to learn how to bake banana bread from an estate agent. Couldn't give a shit that this is how an estate agent thinks this is an important recipe for me. So stick to those things, property and the local area, and become an expert in those things for people. People who are one step further along might find some ebooks on selling and letting interesting or market stats, information about what's going on in the area or how prices are changing and all of that sort of thing. People at the next stage down might want to see testimonial videos but the key here is that you don't you don't need to figure out who sees which bits of content your system figures it out for you so in the old world which is still the case for for many people in a state agency it worked like the this kind of graph shows on the left uh, i can give you an instant valuation is probably a good example of this uh, you would use marketing just to raise awareness and get some sort of interest, maybe get them to do an instant valuation, which would probably put them at the stage of consideration. And then sales needs to jump in. So for most agents, they phone every single instant valuation right, relentlessly. But those people, they don't convert straight over into valuations. They don't, if they wanted a valuation, they would have phoned you for one in the first place. They just went online. They're only at the stage of consideration. But that's how things worked in the old world. We need to find the active market, throw the rest away. There was one person that wanted evaluation, all 25 other details that we got, complete waste of time. But in the new world, we don't want our highly paid sales staff wasting their time with people that are not ready. Our systems can continue to 7-Eleven for those people 24-7, 365, while our team focus on the high value tasks. So even at the stage of consideration, if you look at the right hand side where someone maybe has done an instant valuation or downloaded an ebook, that's fine. Our system knows it will start swapping up the content. Maybe it will start showing them some more testimonial stuff now. Maybe it will start showing them some content around why instant valuations are not that accurate and you need an estate agent. And as they start moving down that funnel, suddenly our sales team will start getting alerted of people whereby they can make the right call at the right time. So with so much data, how do these companies know who to call? So they do it using something called lifecycle data systems through a process of centralizing their data. That might sound super technical. I'm gonna try and break it down for you using a company that we all know very well as a great example, which is Google. So Google use lifecycle data systems. Google are not one of the most valuable companies on the planet because they have a really popular search engine and a, and a useful email tool. They are one of the most valuable companies on the planet because they centralize their data in lifecycle data systems. So let me give you an example of that. Google know every single thing about you. They know everything you search for about coronavirus, about your job, about holidays, all your deepest, darkest secrets, everything you worry about with your kids, with your wife, with your husband, they know all of that information. They also know every email that you get and they read all those emails and every reply you send and how often you talk to people in your emails. They also know all the data that you store in your Google Sheets and what that data is about and, and they know where you travel to on Google Maps and when you travel there and how often you travel there and how long it takes but they don't keep all that information separate in different tools. At the center of it all, they have a life cycle data system that puts it all together on one profile. So it all goes on Mark Burgess's profile. And so therefore, Google are the only company who can put the right content in front of the right people at exactly the right moment. And companies around the world pay them large sums of money to do that. And they can't be beaten. They can't be caught because it would take another company 20 years of doing that to just get to where Google is already today. You can't just switch it on. They've been amalgamating that data over long periods of time. So they can't be knocked off their perch. They can't possibly be beaten unless somehow they choose to fuck it up. 
but you get the you get the point and all of these companies are the same amazon is the same apple is the same facebook is the same netflix is the same tesla is the same tesla i mean you might think so how is tesla a, a, a life cycle data system tesla to have a self-driving car needs 20 cameras on the outside and the inside microphones everywhere it near it it knows where you go, when you go there, what you're wearing, whether you're happy, whether you're sad, who you're traveling with, what you're talking about, all of that stuff. So for these companies, <clears throat> CRM is not the center of their business. It's a part of their business. The customers are the center of their business. And this is where a problem has been created for a state agency. CRMs were designed to help us. Agents see them as the centerpiece of their business, but they're not. Yes, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, they were key for manual tasks like keeping notes, but the world's moved on so much from a technical perspective. That's just now a small part of the jigsaw that you need in order to have a good overview of your business. Everything, including, the, including those things that CRM does, needs to feed into one central life cycle system and keep that one central record on each person, telling you not just if they've had a valuation from you, but who's been reading your content, which type of content were they reading, who's been on your website, when were they on the website, which emails and which Facebook ads uh, do they do need, need to go out automatically, which ones have they been looking at, which ones need to go to people that have done an instant valuation, asking them to do a face-to-face -face valuation, which of your portal inquiries have got properties to sell, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in a life cycle system, you can see a live funnel of your whole database showing exactly where everybody is. And the system is working it all out for you based on thousands of algorithms. You're not having to figure this out. You're not having to go, oh, this guy's looked at this piece of content. So I think I'm gonna put him in this part of the funnel. It's all being done for you in the background. Another way of looking at centralized life cycle systems is to look at back to when we used to need one of these devices to do four different tasks, make a phone call, take a picture, listen to music, browse the internet. And then this clever guy came along and put all of them inside one central system. Um, and because of that, the iPhone can now do millions of things, but it can do them all because it's all in one centralized ecosystem. You just download the app and it works. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to connect it up via something. So the iPhone itself is a centralized system and they are very protective over who can create apps and they all work from inside that one ecosystem. But the development and innovation, it never stops. It wasn't a tool that was created, finished. You know, when, when we used to have you know, Nokia 8810 and that's the phone, that's it. When you want an upgrade, you get a new phone. The iPhone has new apps appear every single day but you don't have to figure them out. You don't have to connect it up. It just works. <clears throat> Currently, the state agency works on a distributed data system. So there's nothing wrong with any of these tools or tech. I'm sure they're all great, but it's the principle that I'm showing you. The idea is that each one does their own great thing. And then hopefully we can connect them all up somehow using some sort of an API, but it doesn't work. And we know this as the rest of the world went through this 10 years ago. Yes, you can pass contact details around different systems automatically, but it falls down in so many places that it just becomes impossible to manage and super important data gets lost along the way. It also leaves you with no clear view as to what all of your contacts, where they are in the funnel in terms of who to speak to. Who should be seeing what? Where are they? Who's been looking at emails? Who's been reading this type of content? Who's been doing this? Who's been doing that? You've got no idea. And so you end up back where you started, not knowing who to call. So you try to call everyone. And when you try to chase two rabbits, you usually end up with none. So that ends up taking us all the way back to where we started. So much wasted time and effort and money in the marketing currently being done in the state agency because we don't have systems that make us efficient in who to speak to to remove lots of manual tasks which all leads us to an admin problem
what starts here changes the world. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. The things that make us different, those are our superpowers. Every day when you walk out the door, put on your imaginary cape, and go out there and conquer the world. The world is too dangerous and the world is too difficult for you to think that you can do these things alone. If you find your spark, I commend you. Now, who are you going to ask for help and when are you going to accept 